Ooh. Uh, speaking of coffee, yeah. this is special. Oh. I think we're good. So, she asked me to put together a thing about the difficult airway cart, and that kind of morphed into a broader look at kind of a difficult airway in an OR setting. I'm, I'm used to looking at this through the lens of like a physician and giving lectures to physicians about this kind of stuff, and so I've had to kind of alter it because y'all don't need to know that stuff, and you d probably don't care um, about like all the nitty gritty of how to do the things. It's more along the lines of what's going through our heads when we're having a problem with an airway, um, and then what our tools and stuff look like, that if we can say, hey, we need a this, then it can be produced in front of us, and at least you have an idea of what that kind of stuff looks like and what it's used for. So that's kind of where I'm going at, at with this. Um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, if I can operate this. Never mind. Boom. Okay, so here's the things we're going over. Um, we're going to go over what a difficult airway is. We're gonna, I'm going to show you what the difficult airway algorithm is and where that came from and why that's used. By no means do you need to know a lot in that algorithm. It's a little overwhelming to look at, but it'll be all right. I'll get you through it. Uh, tools that we use, and then our difficult airway cart, we finally get to that and kind of uh, go through pieces of it. So what are difficult airways? Water difficult airways. I may have been very sleepy when I made most of this PowerPoint that I obviously stole artistic stuff from online because I'm not this good of an artist. Um, okay, so there's two different categories of difficult airways. Known difficult airways where we actually have a heads up and we know what's going on. And those are more uh, your awake innovations, your elective use of like having a fiber optic scope in there and things like that. These kind of airway situations involve a lot more setup from us and probably a little bit of hand wringing because that's what my people do. But what is really like the scary part is the unknown difficult airway. When you get into it and all of a sudden something becomes a difficult airway in an instant. You know what I mean? So uh, you kind of structure this stuff based on what is making a d airway difficult. There are difficult, uh, sometimes it's difficult to mask somebody. That's a little bit scary because if you can't mask somebody, you have very limited time to do something. Um, there is a, what they used to call it, cannot innovate, cannot ventilate. CICV. So those are patients that you can't, just can't get anything in, and, and that's the leading cause of like airway-related death in the OR is those sorts of patients. Um, difficult laryngoscopy, you've all seen this happen, uh, is we go in there and we're like, oh, I don't see anything. Let me ch try to change something, and we kind of troubleshoot things on the fly there. Uh, difficult SGA placement. So every time you see SGA in any of my lectures, it really means an LMA. Technically, LMA is a brand, not a device, and so they just kind of invented that genre. So we refer to everything as an LMA, but really it's just a supraglottic airway instead of a laryngeal mask airway. So sometimes we have difficult uh, time placing those. I feel like those are a little bit easier to troubleshoot, and so you guys probably don't notice that we're having issues with it. Um, and then difficult intubations, right, uh, which is similar to difficult laryngoscopy, but sometimes you can have a difficult time doing the laryngoscopy, but an easy time getting in the, the actual tube. So anyway, that kind of goes hand in hand. Um, and, and this sort of, this definition can come and go depending on your anesthesiologist. So because one anesthesiologist has a difficult time doing stuff doesn't necessarily mean every anesthesiologist is, but it definitely perks our ears up when we're thinking about things. Okay. So here is uh, different risk factors for different things. Um, so for difficult mass ventilation, uh, it, by the way, if you'll notice a common theme in here, being a male kind of sucks because you're at risk for everything. Um, but having uh, being a male, for whatever reason, 
put you at risk for difficult mass ventilation. Uh, sleep apnea, absence of teeth, believe it or not, because your teeth actually kind of prov provide some structure to hold your lips away from everything, and so that actually makes things easier to mass ventilate when you have teeth. Uh, so having no teeth makes it difficult. Facial hair can be really hard because you can't get a good seal on the mask. Uh, obesity, uh, this is supposed to be Malampati 3 slash 4, not 3 fourths. Um, Cannot protrude the mandible. What do I mean by that? Uh, we'll get to that here in a second. So, uh, uh, short thyromental distance. Thyromental distance we'll get into a little bit in a second as well, but it's a measurement that we kind of eyeball and look at to determine if somebody has a, is going to have an issue. And then any abnormal face or neck anatomy. Asymmetry can be really hard to mass ventilate people. Um, difficult LMA placement. All males sleep apnea. Poor dentition because sometimes it's hard to get things around like really wiggly teeth uh, if they're about to fall out. History of neck radiation. When people have neck radiation, everything is real tight and non-compliant, and so nothing moves the way it's supposed to. Having a small mouth opening also. Uh, we use a, what is it, enter incisor gap. So ideally, if somebody opens their mouth, we want to be able to put like three vertical fingers in there. I think... Each finger is supposed to be two centimeters, so really just two, cent or, or, uh, two fingers in the mouth between the teeth um, is like the minimum, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, mouth opening that puts you not at risk. Uh, having real big tonsils can be an issue, and any sort of airway pathology, because obviously if something's in your airway, making uh, it'll make the LMA not seal good. And then difficult intubation, anyone that's had a history of a difficult intubation is at risk, obviously, because it was hard once, it's probably hard again. Um, having a small mouth opening, short thyromental distance that we mentioned, short sternomental distance, which is I'm going to go through here in a second as well. Having a neck extension that kind of sucks, so not being able to move your neck up and down. Malampati 3 or 4. Um, and then also can't protrude the mandible upper upper lip bite test we'll get to in a second. Uh, also having a large neck circumference. Not so much BMI. You don't see BMI on here anywhere because we've kind of been phasing that out. But part of the BMI can be neck circumference. Uh, and that is a bigger predictor than just BMI itself, shall we say. Um, and also non-compliant tissues, history of neck radiation, those sorts of things make it difficult uh, to intubate somebody. So this is a picture of the mandible protrusion test, also known as the upper lip bite test. So, and I know everybody's going to do this here in a minute because it's really fun to do that when you're listening to lectures. But um, ideally, you want to see people be able to bite their upper lip and go above the vermilion border, which is that top border between your lip and your mustache or whatever the hell this is called, Right. Um, class one is a good one, right? Everybody do it with me now. Like that? That is, for most people should be able to do that. There are a lot of people that can't. And that indicates that you, your mandible doesn't really have a great uh, forward motion, right? Class three looks like you're smiling, and that really sucks. If that is you biting your upper lip, we're going to have a bad time, okay? So that, that's what that test is that we usually will, if I have, I don't routinely do a lot of these with patients. You kind of walk in, you sum up the situation, and then I get into the nitty gritty of, let's see if you can do this. Let's see if you can, let me measure your thyromental distance, kind of eyeball it sort of thing. Um, here is hyomental and thyromental distances. So you're Hyomental distance, I'm going to read it on here because my laptop's really small. Uh, hyomental distance is between your mentum, which is your chin, the actual tip bone of that, and then your hyoid bone, which is really the first curvature of your neck, not the cartilage in your um, trachea, but the, the hyoid bone that everything kind of connects to. And so ideally we want to see six centimeters in there, which is uh, about three finger breadths, right? So that's your hyomental distance. Your thyromental distance is, and this is also a good test because you can kind of check neck extension with this as well, but your thyromental distance 
is from your mentum all the way down to your thyroid cartilage, which is the kind of, you can feel it on your neck. It's got that kind of V-shape, way more pronounced in males, but uh, they are Adam's apple or whatever. But anyway, so that distance is supposed to be over six, is that right? Over six centimeters, okay, which is kind of in line with the hyomental distance. Um, and something I came across when looking all this stuff up is it's all kind of relative to size. So this measurement is going to be different in Rebecca versus Todd, right? Like, I would hope that those two measurements aren't the same, because then that would mean Todd probably has a really short distance right there, because he's so much of a taller person, right? So a five-foot-tall person and a seven-foot-tall person have, have different uh, caveats, right? Any questions on this so far? Okay. So we also check for cervical mobility. Uh, I've never once actually measured the angle between somebody's forehead when they're looking up and down. I just ask them to look up and down. Uh, I think, oh, it's not on this slide, but I read somewhere it's supposed to be like greater than 30 degrees or something. Anyways, uh, sternomental distance. This is another thing that apparently we look at. This is supposed to be 12 and a half centimeters, which really isn't that long, but from your chin all the way down to the sternal notch. So the summary of all of this, why I'm showing you all these people bending their necks in weird ways, is just to show you there's so many different things that can be looked at to help evaluate an airway. Malam potty, I didn't even put a picture in here because everybody already knows what that is when we ask you to open your mouth, stick out your tongue. That is one measurement of different things. I have had so many instances where I've had someone have a really good looking Malam potty and then I get in the OR and I'm having trouble. I can't see anything, I can't ventilate them, whatever. There's lots of different reasons that that would happen. I've also had patients where they have a horrible mullen potty and they're really easy to innovate. So um, one simple metric does not necessarily dictate all of this for us, okay? So now we get to the difficult airway algorithm. I'm gonna zoom through this because it's just kind of a rather large thing. And y'all, I don't think, need to know a lot about where it is. But this is what's going through our head when all this stuff is going on. So the American Society of Anesthesiologists created this in about 2003. It gets updated from time to time as we actually learn more about how to do airways. Uh, it was last updated uh, last year at some point in time. Um, and none of this has to do with pediatrics, by the way. This is all just adults. Uh, here's this big complicated mess of a thing. When they first started it, this is the old algorithm. It all kind of starts off with, you know, do we think we're going to have a problem? And then you get into, uh, we're going to either do an awake intubation or an asleep intubation. Uh, if you're doing an asleep intubation and things fail, then you go into the lower half of this. And, and it's just kind of shit hitting the fan. The new algorithm is similar, but a little more dolled up because it's 2022, we survived COVID and we can't have crappy looking slides anymore. So uh, this is all like pre-planning stuff of like, is this patient gonna have a bad time? If you think they are, go to an awake airway. In reality, I know a lot of you guys have noticed that our patients are going to have some of these things. Yet, we don't do awake intubations real often. Who's seen an awake intubation? Okay, majority, but there's a lot of hands I didn't even see. So, these are not rare instances up here. Why aren't we going through this algorithm to do awake airway management? The bottom line is, one, we have way better tools than we used to have. Two, awake intubations are very cumbersome and not wonderfully easy. And three, the patient experience is awful, usually. So uh, there's a lot of different reasons that that takes place. And it's also just comfort of an anesthesiologist, that too. I'm probably more comfortable uh, troubleshooting a difficult airway than doing an awake intubation, because we don't do them that often either. Um, you go, this the awake intubation management thing, that's all going to be done by us. That doesn't have a whole lot to do with today's purposes, but I just wanted to throw that in there. And then we run into, this is really what changed in 2022, is that um, 
there's going to be this emergency pathway and not emergency pathway. Emergency pathway, they're desatting. I can't get air in and out of them, that sort of thing. Everything's fine with a difficult airway if you can breathe for the patient, right? It's not ideal. I, I don't want to sit there and mask a patient for 45 minutes, but I can if that's what it takes to, like, keep someone alive. So anyways, there's, there's the difficult airway algorithm. Now, this is the meat and potatoes of this whole lecture that I wanted to show you guys are the different tools that we use and things to look for. Some of these tools we have here, some of these tools we do not necessarily have here. I'll point out the things you need to know. Um, so here's the, like your basic categories of airway, right? You have a mask, which is the kind of least invasive, most basic part of an airway. That is typically the worst airway you could have uh, because there are so many different factors that make it not work good, etc. cetera. Uh, a superglottic airway or an LMA is better than a mask. It's like a mask you shove into your hypopharynx, basically. It creates somewhat of a seal. It's way more reliable than just a mask, but it's not a sealed airway. It does have its problems. An endotracheal tube, which we like to call the definitive airway, is a step up in invasiveness. It is temporary. Uh, it is placed all the time that you guys help us with. Um, and I don't need to go into a lot more than that. And then we go into invasive airways, which is your surgical airway, right? I'm going to poke a hole in your trachea, and we're going to ventilate you that way. And technically, that's like the most invasive airway you could have. So here's uh, airway adjuncts. Adjuncts are things that I can use to help me do uh, more of a mask airway situation, right? So we've got our oral airways. We've got our nasal airways. These are very common here. We have things that look like both of this. Oral airways are color-coded based on size for every 10 millimeters I hope we never have. I hope you're never in a situation where an anesthesiologist says, "Get me an 80 millimeter airway," because that's going to be dumb. I say, "Get me a yellow airway. Get me a green airway. Get me a red airway." Um, and that's why they're color coded, is because that's so much easier than trying to read imprinted plastic. Uh, nasal airways are usually sized by French or uh, uh, much easier by millimeter, like an endotracheal tube. So if I used a 70 airway or sorry, endotracheal tube in a patient, I might use a 7.0 nasal airway in them as well. Okay, let's go to the wonderful world of supraglottic airways, okay? There's so much crap floating around about this. So the LMA Unique is also the classic LMA that we had very uh, recently here. The, the classic LMA is the reusable plain Jane LMA. I think we still have them here somewhere, but we have largely gone to disposable LMAs, which are called the LMA Unique. This is from the LMA company. This is what they have. So this is your most primitive LMA that we have, okay? Um, at some point, they developed something called the LMA Fast Track. We have these. It is in our difficult airway cart. They have this handle on the, the front that is... Laser pointer, yeah. So this handle right here, this handle uh, is is kind of rigid, provides structure to the whole thing so that you can, once you place this LMA in somebody, you can manipulate it around. And the whole purpose of the fast track is for you to intubate through it. This was the first LMA to actually put an endotracheal tube through. And it's still pretty good at that. you got to lube up a lot of things. It's not wonderfully simple. But uh, it can get done. Again, we still have this. I've never once used one in my entire life. Uh, I hope I never have to. Um, there's, I think, easier ways of accomplishing that goal. But uh, never mind. I digress. The next one is the LMA Flexible. This was developed so because the LMAs usually have real rigid plastic that sticks straight up. So uh, we have LMA Flexibles over at Health Center. We use them a lot for eyeball cases. I don't know what we're using. I, I don't know where these have gone since we're not doing so much eyeball stuff. But it allows you to put in an LMA but get the tube out of the way. That's really the only difference there. Um, and then uh, LMA Supreme came out. This is a disposable version of what's called a second generation LMA. Uh, it has a gastric port. So now I can actually put a OG tube down, suction out the stomach, 
That's one of the biggest complications with LMAs and why we can't use LMAs for just everything is because it doesn't seal the airway. You are still at risk for aspiration and if you, uh, that makes people more comfortable to just put an OG tube down in everybody. It's not quite necessary, but some people uh, want to do that. Okay? But those are just the LMAs. Okay? The rest of the superglottic airways are different brands. AirQ is one I've used at other places. These little color-coded caps that are on there come off and you can innovate through it, okay? That's their big thing. Um, eye gel, these are used a lot by EMS. This is a LMA that doesn't have an inflatable cuff. It also looks like something really dirty, but I didn't design it. So uh, it, it doesn't have a cuff, you just place it and it's done. You don't have to inflate anything or deflate anything, it just goes in and it supposedly seals real well. I've never used one, but I've seen them, they do look dirty. Uh, Ambu has their whole line of LMAs. Each one of these has a fun different name, but they're all kind of the same. And then there's something called a King Airway. I haven't seen one of these in a while, but I did notice that we have one in our difficult airway cart, and these are cool as hell. So these were developed for use by EMS when they're having a difficult airway. This was before Glidescopes and McGraths and all this stuff. So this is a huge tube that is placed down the throat, and you will see on here there is this little bitty cuff right here uh, and it's designed for this airway to go into one of two places right it's either going to go in the esophagus or it's going to go in the actual trachea okay if it goes in the trachea godspeed for that patient because their throat is going to be ruined forever probably because it's such a big stiff tube uh, but most of the time but even if it goes in trachea you can breathe for them and they're not going to die Okay, so I probably should have referred to this as a combi tube rather than a King Airway. Those are technically two different things that look very alike. But a combi tube allows ventilation through either lumen. So if you accidentally place it into the trachea, you can ventilate the patient through that lumen. If it goes into the esophagus, then you can ventilate the lumen in between the two cuffs, allowing for proper airway ventilation. A King Airway only has one ventilatory lumen. So if it's placed into the trachea, it must be withdrawn and replaced. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. It's designed to go into the esophagus. You inflate that little balloon, and then there's a bigger balloon right here. And this bigger balloon is a huge cuff, and it just inflates their whole mouth, oropharynx, everything. And there's a little orifice in between those two things, and you breathe it like a superglottic airway. If you occlude the top and the bottom, and all you have left is the opening of your airway and then their vocal cords, if you push air in and out, they will breathe. So this was developed to basically combat, you know, I guess people dying out in the field. So these are all superglottic airways, huge field of study, uh, lots of different brands, lots of different mechanisms. They're all kind of serving a similar purpose. I'm going to put a mask down your throat and breathe for you. Uh, specialty laryngoscopes. This is something that we have here as well. It's really weird. It's a Mac blade, looks kind of similar, but it has this big long metal part that kind of goes up that parallels sort of the handle. And when you depress this, it actually deflects the tip of the Mac blade up to broaden your view a little bit. I've only used this a handful of times. Again, now with like indirect video laryngoscopy, we have better tools, but it's called a Mac flex tip. It lives in our difficult airway cart, okay? This is where everything has been uh, snowball revolutionizing difficult airways since like 2000, okay? When I started residency, we pretty much just had Glidescope. I think that was like the OG thing. And it was just like these sterilizable handles. They still make those. The Glidescopes that I think we have now have these clear disposable handles that go over the thing. Um, something else we use a lot is a McGrath. There's a C-Mac, which is also similar. You have all these handles that can be put on and off there. Um, so you guys are probably most familiar with these things because when we ask for difficult airway stuff, this is probably really high up on the list of things to grab. Um, the new thing that has come out in the past, I don't know, probably less than a decade, is all these fiber optic scopes that are disposable. So Glidescope has these fiber optic deals. C-Mac has always had like... Uh, sterilizable fiber optic scopes that we use a lot for like our double lung ventilation cases. Um, and so this, this is really the bulk of our difficult airway supply at this point because they've gotten to where they work so well, they're very reliable, uh, 
the McGrath really is portable uh, and easy to go grab and use and things like that. So we Are use those a bunch. Yes. On the big tall tower glide scope that's new to the main, you also have that capability at north. There is magnetic sort of hanging on the wall. And it has been frozen to the scope. It's not a big thing. It's not a big thing. It's not a big thing. And a bunch of you may already know this, but for the glide scopes, if you have to go get a glide scope with like the normal laryngoscope handle or whatever, they make stylets that are supposed to go with that that make it a lot easier. You don't have to have those stylets, but boy, does it make it's designed to be used with their stylets. Those stylets are not disposable. We sterilize those. Please don't throw them away. They look like something you could probably throw away, and I'm sure they're stupid expensive for no reason whatsoever. It's a wire. Um, but those should live in a little tray underneath the GlideScope screens, right? I just call this category long sticks because the, that's all I can come up with. So, uh, bougies. Bougies have been around for a long time. Has anybody seen anyone get an airway with a bougie? Less, but that's a thing that is done. So bougies are typically blue. They're disposable. It's a real long, like I said, just a long stick, but it is flexible. It has a coup de tip, which is that little tip that's kind of deflected. And what these are designed to do is there, there's a certain amount of rigidity to it, but it's still flexible. So not only is it like a stylet that you can like put that in the airway and then put a tube over it, which is what kind of what I'm showing here with like a laryngoscope uh, going into the airway. But if you get into the trachea, you have tracheal rings that that, that tip will bounce off of and you can feel it all the way up that stick. And so um, this is my go-to for a bloody airway. If you have blood in the airway, you can't see anything, especially with like uh, laryngoscopy itself is probably difficult because there's trauma. Um, video laryngoscopy is out the window because all of the video laryngoscopy cameras are really small and any one drop of blood will completely invalidate your view of everything. And so trying to use those in a bloody airway is, is really difficult. Get a bougie. You can put a bougie down into a blood puddle and feel those tracheal rings and know you're in the trachea and throw an airway over it and then deal with the consequences of having blood all in the lungs, etc. Um, so that's a really good tool. Bougies are on the back of our anesthesia carts everywhere, whether it's Health Center, Maine, etc. Um, we also have these yellow things that are, uh, well, I mean, uh, these yellow things down here are just different colored bougies, but over here is airway exchange catheters. These are super long looking catheters that are like, I don't know, like 60 centimeters or something like that, that uh, you can, it's designed to literally exchange airways like in the ICU and stuff. Uh, the cuff broke on this tube and this person has this impossibly difficult airway. I, I don't want to have to go through all the rigmarole to re-intubate them. So I'm going to put an airway exchange catheter down, take that airway out and slide in a new tube over it. Um, kind of Seldinger technique style. Um, a bougie is too short to exchange an airway with. Uh, some people are more um, well versed, I guess, or comfortable using airway exchange catheters. I think anesthesiologists are way more prone to get a bougie, and ICU docs are way more prone to get an airway exchange catheter. Both of them can be used in similar manners. But like I said, a bougie short enough, trying to exchange an airway over it's kind of hard. Um, another benefit that bougies, by definition, you can't ventilate through them. Airway exchange catheters uh, usually have some sort of attachment that you can hook up a bag to or passive oxygen or whatever. And if that's placed down the airway, you can hook stuff up to it and actually move air through it. It's got a hollow lumen um, that can be used. So... Uh, I don't use it that often. We do have them, I know, at Maine in the anesthesia workroom for various purposes. How often we go through these? Never. <laughs> we don't use these very often. But it's a tool. Okay. Um, 
Does anyone here know what a retrograde innovation is? Awesome, because these are cool as hell. Uh, never done one. Kind of, kind of want to do one, but I'd kind of shit my pants if I ever had to do one because it's, it's crazy. So retrograde means backwards, right? So here's how these are done. So you start out like you're doing a crike, and somebody that just like you can't intubate or something like that. And this can be done very hastily if you can't ventilate them. I've heard of people doing it. It's more of an old technique, but you basically get a needle through the cricothyroid membrane like you're doing a crike. You angle that upwards towards their glottic opening. You run a wire through it, and that wire will come out of their mouth or their nose. You usually secure the wire at this end, and then you can thread an airway over the top of it. That airway will hang up wherever this insertion site is right here. And then you can pull the wire out and complete the innovation. This, in skilled hands, this can be done in seconds. Um, never done one. Hope to never do one. I've also never done a crike, but that's beside the point. Um, kind of a crazy thing. So. I don't know if anyone will ever do this here in this place because, again, we have so many better tools. But it's a really kind of cool semi-surgical airway because all you leave afterwards is a needle puncture through your throat, and that's not wonderfully damning. Um, and you could save somebody's life doing it. So, okay. Uh, any question about the tools that I just went over? Any of that stuff? Okay. So, our difficult airway cart. Here's Yes? Jet. jet ventilation. I didn't really go over that, um, but yes, that would totally fit in this lecture. Sorry for yet another interjection, but since I forgot to add jet ventilation into my lecture, I thought I could touch on it really quick. So jet ventilation is a ventilation technique that refers to the delivery of oxygen via a high pressure jet ventilator. Okay, A jet of oxygen is used for insufflation of the lungs followed by passive expiration. This can be done repeatedly to ventilate the patient, which will both oxygenate and hopefully remove CO2. Okay, so I wanted to go through a few of the things that you need to know for this. So here's the device that we have, okay? So we've got this hose right here. This is your oxygenating hose. This hooks up to the wall oxygen, okay? This handle right here is what the anesthesiologist will hold. This lever will actually be depressed to administer that jet of oxygen, okay? You've got a pressure manometer here so you can keep track of what the pressures kind of look like. And then this is the exit, right? Whatever comes through here comes through here at a high pressure. And then there's this lure lock connector at the end. Um, that lure lock connector can be extended with either arterial line tubing or IV extension tubing is usually fine, but, but can be extended with any sort of lure lock tubing. Okay. And so here's what it hooks up to. This looks very similar to a cricothyroidotomy kit, but this is actually much smaller. This is just a tiny needle that goes transtracheally um, that you can place and that uh, has a lure lock connector. Obviously, this syringe is used to help kind of guide the placement. But once you get this in place, you take the syringe off and you connect the jet ventilator. Okay. It looks like this. And this is called transtracheal jet ventilation. All right, so um, you you do this for emergency uh, methods, right? To emergently oxygenate somebody, it can be placed really quick. It only leaves a little needle stick, so it's pretty inconsequential. Um, we also at Logan Health do uh, supraglottic jet ventilation electively for certain cases involving the airway. Our ENT docs will basically have this view. They'll use this. Uh, direct uh, laryngoscope to kind of look down through here and they can do surgery through it either with an endoscope or not. Um, but same sort of rules apply. Anesthesiologist is sitting here with this handle. They depress that trigger and then uh, the that extension tubing or whatever can be hooked up. I don't know which that's a light. So I guess maybe this is the either another light or basically where that jet ventilation hookup would be. Um, and so this allows uh, the ENT surgeon to direct that jet of oxygen towards the glottic opening 
And you can achieve the same sort of thing. You hold down the jet ventilator, you hold down that uh, lever, and it administers oxygen at really high pressure towards the glottic opening. And you can see the chest rise up. And then when you let go, the chest falls and that's expiration. This is not without uh, some side effects and negative things, right? So everything has risks. Risks here include barotrauma, which is the number one risk. We're putting things in at a really high pressure. Um, but also you can run into the drying out of uh, mucosa, uh, damage to things. You can get pre or necrosis, like tissue necrosis, secondary to this. So um, obviously very short amount of time, but it can be done safely um, with limited risk. But I just wanted you guys to know um, kind of what we're looking at and what jet ventilation even is and what it looks like okay okay so we go on to the difficult airway cart this lives in i don't know where it lives at health center actually you'd have thought i'd want to know that for this lecture um in maine it's in the anesthesia workroom it says difficult airway cart real big um right up here at the top and it is useful in certain situations, it has largely been supplanted by, uh, uh, maybe in the 80s and 90s, we had um, a difficult airway cart and it had all our stuff in it, okay? And this would get moved from room to room and you'd bring it in like a crash cart. Give me the difficult airway cart and you'd come rolling in the room. That has largely been supplanted over time with all these tools that don't fit in a cart nicely, like a glide scope, like the fiber optic stuff. You can't really wad that up and put it in a drawer. And so the difficult airway cart has kind of spread out and now it's all these different supplies that kind of live in different areas. Um, but we still have a cart. It still has things in it. Here's what's in it, okay? Um, we might want to rename this awake innovation cart, but in that, maybe not, because it does still have some emergency airway supplies in it. So the first drawer, drawer number one, has awake innovation supply. This is your awake innovation drawer, okay? And it has all the fun stuff all in one place that you would need for an awake innovation. The biggest part of an awake innovation, why it sucks so bad, is you have to essentially suppress someone's gag reflex when you're putting a big tube down their throat, and that can be rather difficult. Um, it has So it has lidocaine 4%. It has the nebulization like viscous lidocaine. You can put in a nebulizer and get a patient to breathe. It's got... Uh, some ointment that, believe it or not, uh, we used to take tongue depressors, wrap gauze around it, and make a lidocaine lollipop, which I'm sure tasted like absolute garbage. But we would make a patient like sit there and gag themselves with it until the gag reflex was just gone. Um, we're monsters. So we have umbilical tape in there to, because we'll use that to tie stuff. Uh, lube. We have cetacane spray, which is a spray version of numbing stuff that goes in the airway. Uh, peep valves in there, tincture of benzoin to like glue stuff to people's faces, etc. That's what kind of lives in that drawer. As we go down, drawer two uh, has a bunch of oral airways, nasal airways, uh, some specialty mask stuff. Uh, I know we have, uh, this is for bronch. We've got this, I think they call it a Y, bronch adapter or something like that. Um, so that kind of lives in there. Uh, and a nebulizer, which is this. That's what you put lidocaine, different meds in, you can nebulize it. In the third drawer, these are our fast strikes. These are the old fast strikes we have from yesteryear. You, I didn't really explain it real well, but when you, you're pushing an endotracheal tube through it, there's going to be a point in time where the endotracheal tube is completely buried in the LMA, but it's not really through the airway. So you have these little plungers, these long... Why they're flesh colored, I don't know, but these long plunger deals that you can use to push the endotracheal tube further into the airway so that you can pull the trach out and then connect to the endotracheal tube. Uh, also pushing so that you don't pull the endotracheal tube out with the LMA. Uh, we also have those MAC flex tip blades. They live here as well. Uh, I'd show you drawer four, but I think there's nothing in it. So we'll go on to drawer five. These are different reusable LMAs. Like I said, we, we have disposable LMAs here now that we use for stuff. And so we don't use a whole lot of reusable stuff, but we do have the flexible LMAs in here that are kind of wire reinforced. 
uh, smaller than usual endotracheal tubes that are kind of special. They make endotracheal tubes that are smaller size, that look like pediatric tubes, but they're longer. So if I have somebody come in with like head and neck cancer and I can't fit anything but like a four and a half endotracheal tube in their throat, that tube's not gonna be very long. I'm barely gonna be able to connect it, right? So they make all these different sizes of tubes that are like super long that you can cut to size or whatever for your patients. Um, Rebecca, do we even have those? Is that what these are? No, those are just regular ones. Those are just plain pediatric tubes? Okay, so we do have something. Okay. But they do make all sorts of sizes that are longer. Um, what else in there? Glidescope stylets live here for whatever reason. I guess they're extras, because most of them are on the Glidescope itself, right? And I would recommend that, because I guess if you're going and grabbing a Glidescope, you're not going to think about the accessories that go with it. Um, but that's where that lives. In the last drawer of our difficult airway cart, this is kind of your Hail Marys, your Crike kits, uh, your retrograde wire intubation set that I hope we never have to use, but here's the wire and the needle and such that goes into it. You can also accomplish a retrograde intubation with just an IV catheter, but it's a little more cumbersome. Uh, here's one of those king tubes. I've, this, I, this is the first one I've ever seen in my life, and we have it here. Y'all aren't surprised. Um, I've never used one. I'm sure it's dramatic, but that's better than dying. Uh, on the back wall behind the cart, we have all the hanging stuff, okay? So these are your bronchial blockers, uh, airway exchange catheters that are real long, bougies that are shorter but still look like sticks. Uh, we got a really old, difficult airway algorithm on there. Um, I don't know what this box is that's sitting on here. Rebecca, what's that? Light source. Light source. Light source. For what? The scopes? For the okay. Most of our stuff. Yeah, because all of our, all of the anesthesia scopes that I'm thinking of, we still have one that's like an eyepiece, like flexible fiber optic scope. But like I've used that once, and I can't see anything through it. So. For the most part, our light source is built into the Glidescope or the CMAC or whatever else we're using. Um, so hopefully that's not needed. Okay. I'm done. Thanks for watching, everyone. Sorry this video came out so late and with so many edits. Uh, but if you like this video, please go check out my other lectures on my YouTube page. Also hit subscribe if you want to see more just like it. And please let me know of any topics and things you'd like me to cover in the future. Have a good one.